Hey everyone, uh, it's time, it's time to talk about Avengers Endgame. Sorry, it's been a while waiting to get this done. Uh, I know it came out like a week ago as of when I'm filming this. But I felt I needed to see it twice before doing a review because I tend to see most Marvel films you know, at least twice within the time that uh, they're in cinemas just to make sure, as a fan, my overall opinion of the film isn't entirely judged on, in the moment, sort of fanboyisms. So, like, the first time I'm watching it, I could have a moment where it's like, oh, that's so awesome, and then I'm looking back again as a reviewer and thinking, maybe that's not as awesome as I thought overall just because my nerdisms was taking over for a sec but uh also i didn't also i well, also because this is a spoiler one i didn't want to um openly talk about it in my house here until my housemate had seen it because i didn't want to be a dick because the it when i went to see this for the first time there was a dick who yelled out the big spoiler at the end five minutes in he ran into the screen and just yelled it out public service announcement you know iron man dies yes spoiler alert spoiler alert but he yelled out the big spoiler and he got skull punched in the back of the head so lesson learned children don't be a dickhead anyway so avengers endgame you know what this is about you know y'all saw infinity war y'all know this takes place directly after Infinity War. I think it starts like 22 days after the events of Infinity War. You know, Tony's up on the spaceship with Nebula. They're like kind of becoming friends, but also they're, pro they're going to die very soon because oxygen's going to run out. And all of a sudden, Captain Marvel shows up and brings them back to Earth. And from there we get the movie that the trailers promised us, which was, you know, them going after Thanos. And then, very suddenly, it becomes not the movie we were advertised. Because within the first, I'd say, 15 minutes, they chopped Thanos' head off. So that was just a big, whoa. This movie, like this movie, I believe, is a masterclass in advertising a film because so much of this film, none of it was in the trailer. There's just bits that, like, I was like, wow, because there was, none of it was shown. Like, they showed the first 20 minutes and then maybe one or two shots of later in the film. But, like, there was so much of this movie that wasn't in the trailer, and that came as such a surprise. And I'm bloody welcome surprised at that. But, uh, no. And then, once they've killed Thanos, and once Thor actually has a great line, like, he swings Stormbreaker and just cleaves Thanos' head off. And they're like, why should you do that? And he's like, oh, I went for the head. Uh, lovely little callback to Infinity War. Uh, then it cuts five years, and that was, I thought that was amazing amazing idea for them to do like five years later we see the effects of like oh shit they're now in a world where half of the population has been wiped out and like how does the world like adjust to that and like it doesn't adjust very well to be honest like we see how the characters do but like the world is re really doesn't you know, bounce back from that, and it's really weird, like, you see, like, sta stadiums just abandoned, and, like, it looks rough, and it's like, wow, it's like five years, it's kind of strange, but, you now you see the characters, like, some people do better than others at handling what happened in the aftermath, like, Cap's trying to help people, Black Widow's trying to keep some semblance of, semblance of the Avengers together from whoever survived. Uh, Tony has a kid now, which, like, I was just, oh no. I, I got scared the minute they revealed that he had a kid, because, you know, 
We've learned from Logan that that never ends well, and it didn't. But, uh, uh, Hawkeye is now a vigilante. I love Hulk in this movie. I fucking adore Professor Hulk. He, there's just something about... It, there's just a charm to Professor Hulk that, like... I just felt like they had finally mixed the charm of Bruce Banner with the comedy of the Hulk. And it's like, I, I just... Maybe, probably, yeah, this is my favourite incarnation of the Hulk we've ever seen on screen because it was so different but yet it felt right, it felt like something that they were building to. Because one thing you'll, no you'll, you'll notice if you s watch all of Mark Ruffalo's different times playing the Hulk, it, there's every film it's slightly different, like in the first Avengers it's him, you know, well, and okay, uh, Hulk in The Incredible Hulk, you know, it's him trying to k find a cure for the Hulk. You know, it's him at his sort of, woe is me, worst. You know, it's... Then The Avengers, it's him sort of becoming at ease with the Hulk. Like, you know, becoming accepting of the fact that, yeah, this is just his life and how he deals with it. Age of Ultron, he's dealing with how the world sees the Hulk. You know, the world and the people around him and the people he loves see the Hulk. Then in Thor Ragnarok, you know, you see this big evolution in terms of, like, the Hulk being able to talk and, like, Banner, again, like, Banner becoming slightly less fully controlled by the Hulk. Like, he can do things without the Hulk and the Hulk can do things without Banner. So it's like, and then again in kind of the same in Infinity War, like there is that sort of, Hulk is becoming more sentient in, and his, uh, having his own thoughts and emotions. So like, combining the two was just where they were probably going to end up at some point. And I'm really glad they did it here. Thor is just incredible in this movie. Like, he has fully let himself go out of guilt for, uh, what happened in Infinity War, and just everything that he had lost in the last few films. And, oh my god, Fat Thor, Big Lebowski Thor is everything I never knew I wanted from Thor. Like, I've said it again, I'll say it before and I'll say it again here. Chris Hemsworth is an incredibly good comedic actor. And just him and Korg just playing Fortnite just is something that will never not make me laugh. Like I've seen the movie twice and every time I hear the line of Korg being just being like, Thor, Thor, that, that guy in the TV back, he's calling me a dickhead again. <laughs> oh, just Thor yelling at people on Fortnite, like the world needs more of that. Uh, I, I've seen some people shit on it because like, oh it's you know, it's a joke, making a joke of Thor, it's like, no it's not, like, Thor is still a very capable fighter in this film, like, he is still capable of being a badass, it's just, he has an emotional arc, you know, and it's a big change from what he was in previous films. And it had kind of been set up in Infinity War that he has, he was definitely starting to feel all the losses that he had, because... You know, he lost his mother, and then his dad, and then his planet, and then his best friend, and then his brother, and then half of whoever is left on his planet also went, and it's just like, he was really starting to feel like failure, and like, I'm glad that like, he was, they were able to do something different with Thor, and because it, it is, it does feel like while Iron Man and Captain America have run their course as characters, I think Thor has... And he's, he's finally picked up more momentum as a character, like he is hitting his stride as a character now, while the other characters who he was introduced around the same time of, like the, the rest, the original Avengers cast, like he is the one who is hitting his peak now, where everyone else kind of hit their peak and has finally moved on. Uh, but yeah, no, so Ant-Man Returns, uh, kind of weirdly, like, because of a rat on the control, 
yoke with for the van, which is you know, it's a big convenience. But you know, I don't. I can. I can go with it. And you know, so eventually, basically, they they have to travel back in time to find the different Infinity Stones. And I thought this that was a really cool idea. You know, it felt like Marvel. You know, it was the first time we've seen Marvel really pat themselves on the back here, and it's like. If this was any other franchise, it would kind of feel a bit sort of gratuitous and like very self-congratulatory. But like when you look at it here, it's like no, they've made twenty-one movies, and they all connect, and this all makes sense. And you know, we've all seen these from different angles, and it's like it doesn't. It feels very like wow, they managed to do this and just tie everything in together and really neat bow and it's 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 just it's high it's it's a feat in filmmaking that is unparalleled and this was a celebration of that uh and yeah they don't do the usual sort of time travel rules of time travel malarkey type thing and again i'm okay with that some people complain that maybe it messes up the timeline but i it's one of those things where it's like this film has been 11 years in the making and like I think if anyone has earned the right to go against the general rules of time travel in movies it's Marvel so again I don't really mind it uh what else what else I love the time travel stuff though seeing New York from different angles you know seeing Captain America fight himself see how you know, the Cap um, America's ass joke is wonderful uh what else like seeing and also the fact that they were able to get you know old characters from previous films to come back like Tilda Swinton came back Robert Redford came back for a bit Natalie Portman Rene Russo you know Frank Grillo it was like these characters it felt like wow they've re they went out of their fucking way here and I lo and it really did feel like yeah, this feels like an ending, you know, like obviously there will be more Marvel movies but the way they were able to get old characters to come back for one, for even just a scene, it just felt like, yeah, no, they are pulling, no, they are sparing no expense in trying to make this feel epic, and it did feel epic, and they had callbacks to previous scenes, like, one scene that I flipped my head nearly in the cinema watching was Cap getting into an escalator with a bunch of the Winter Soldier side villains like Sitwell and Frank Grillo, Crossbones and it's like oh shit are, are they gonna do a repeat of the Captain America elevators fight scene which I adore and most Marvel fans adore because most Marvel fans adore Winter Soldier but the thing but and then it was just like, no, he just whispers Hail Hydra, and it's like, oh, it's... I just thought that was an amazing move. Uh, you also, like, you also had Thor and Rocket go to Asgard, and Thor had a nice little conversation with his mother. I thought that was a really nice sort of character moment for Thor, and you know, then you had, like, Nebula got such a juicy role here and I was so happy because Nebula, I, I feel like Nebula has become a more interesting character again than Gamora, like they were both very interesting characters in terms of backstory but I feel because she's been with the Guardians I think part of Gamora's coolness in terms of her backstory with Thanos has been, it was addressed in Infinity War, but it was also kind of blunted by her relationship with the Guardians and her relationship with Star Lord. But Gamora, it's just always felt, you know, better because, you know, in all fairness, like she was the more abused one. So like it was really nice to see her get a good role here, and I like the fact that they were able to use Nebula to bring in. So the 2014 Thanos, like a younger, slightly younger version of Thanos, who didn't know he won in Infinity War. Uh, so it's like, it's a, he has a different perspective of like, he, 
and then he learns that he had he what he wants to he achieves so like he then has a different mentality to the infinity war thanos because he's seen what happens after his destiny which is you know people you know try and fight back so like he just officially had it and it's like you know no i'm just gonna wipe out everyone and start my own universe which you know it again is understandable from his point of view because you know, reasons but uh what else I know I should have done notes. Um, yeah. Oh, I can't believe I. Yes, obviously I'm gonna bring it up. But um, yeah, Black Widow dies. I was shocked to be honest because I had all I had thought yeah Hawkeye's gonna get it like it made sense for Hawkeye when you're looking at the advertising. Yeah, he's gone full Ronin. He's killing people. You know, he's on a dark path. It's like. He is kind of, he is going to sacrifice himself to help get his family back. But then when you think about it, because like, I hadn't even thought of, oh shit, one of them is going to have to die if they go to Vormir. But, you know, they have a fight to the death, literally, and it's a really cool twist on that because they're fighting each other to see who gets to die because they both want to die for the other person, and it's like, it was out of the blue. It was a bit out of the blue for Black Widow to die, but I'm okay with it because it felt right in the story that they were telling, especially the fact that it was surrounding Barton because of the history they have, and I think that is going to help the Black Widow movie that they have coming out, which will be a prequel then, obviously, because they can't really do any more with her because they've killed her off. But I feel like that prequel is now definitely going to play more into that Black Widow Hawkeye relationship because of how Endgame has gone. Uh, Hawkeye was great in this as well. This is definitely the best Jeremy Renner's ever been in the MCU. Uh, but yeah, so like, you know, everyone gets like a really nice mo little moment while during the time travel sequence. Even Tony and. Um, Tony and Steve go back to the 70s at one point, so Tony sees his dad, Cap sees Peggy. Uh, then when they get back to the current day, everything just goes to, oh shit hits the fan and the last act of this movie is incredible. It is the fight sequence. I think it might just... Maybe it's it's on par with the airport sequence from Civil War. Probably actually, you know, but in terms of scale, it's like ten times that. Like it is just everyone. It's beautiful. It's like it's like a CGI motif of like tribute to the last eleven years, and so many people get a cool moment. You know, you get a nice moment with Star Lord and Gamora, and it's an interesting sort of, it's an interesting tease to Guardians Three because we now have a version of Gamora that is different to the original Gamora because she this is a version of Gamora that is from twenty fourteen, not you know, so like a pre Guardians Gamora who now doesn't have Thanos. So, so basically it is Gamora but without any feelings towards Star-Lord, so like, it, it's, it's a nice moment but also a bittersweet moment, and an amazing joke of like, Gamora says to Nebby like, this was the guy I was dating, and it was like, the option, it was between him and a tree, I was like, that line is brilliant. Uh, they had a tease for A-Force which is the all-female Avengers team, uh, which was awesome, like, just all the female characters, but obviously Black Widow, but, you know, and it was like, yeah, like, I, I want to see an A-Force movie after that. It was a really well-done sort of mo girl power moment that wasn't sort of deliberately, oh, only a woman can do this moment. It was just like, oh, how is she going to get the gauntlet to that part of the battlefield? It was like, don't worry, she has help. 
and then it's just all the female characters. It's just like no one, no one said like, oh, the women are gonna do it. It was just it was very much so like, you know, that moment could happen with guy characters, and it would still be awesome. So great moment. Uh, Thor had mom cat no. Cap swung Mjolnir, and it's one of the, maybe the one time in a cinema where I've ever openly just stood up and yelled fuck yeah on both occasions, because that scene was so badass, and it, again it was a moment that they had teased in Age of Ultron, and it just felt so satisfying. And Thor, and Cap was awesome with that thing. Sorry, I keep saying Thor, but no, Cap was amazing with the hammer. Uh, but yeah, so everyone had everyone had their moment. So the battle was, like I said, amazing third act, and it ends with Iron Man sacrificing himself. Which oh, that that scene was emotional as fuck. Uh, just uh, every everything with Spider Man in this movie just made me cry. To be honest, like him coming out of the portal and Tony hugging him, it's just such a beautiful sort of full circle moment for that dynamic and that character relationship. And then him just at the end when Tony's about to die and he's just like, "Oh, we won, Mister Stark," and just apologizing for not being able to. Save him, it's just, oh, so that's, Tom Holland is so good as Spider-Man, and even at the very end, like, when he comes back to school, and he just hugs Ned, and you can clearly see that they've both been dusted, and, oh, just, the emotion even in that, like, he's, Tom Holland's just amazing in this role, but, uh, no, Tony Stark dies, and, you know, it is super emotional, it's a beautiful way to end. Fits his character perfectly. I thought Cap was going to be the one to die, but when you take into account Tony's arc, ever since the first Avengers, even even further back than that, the first Iron Man movie in general, his obsessive personality has always so he he hasn't been able to rest when he's had something he's wanted to do, and ever since the first Avengers, he's wanted to protect the universe from Thanos and he's finally done that and now he can rest literally so it's, it's a beautiful send off so we had two beautiful send offs at the very end and you know and his funeral is perfectly done like the fact that he even got Ty Simpkins to come back as Harley the, little, the kid from Iron Man 3 to just stand out at the funeral like that's such an awesome moment of just character build world building for like Iron Man, just everyone who has affected him in almost any way in the, in the past few films, who isn't dead or in prison because they're a villain, is here. And, you know, it, it's, it's lovely. It was just a lovely end to the character and a beautiful little moment with Happy and his daughter Morgan. That's a call, that was a callback to the Iron, first Iron Man film with Cheeseburgers. And then, and then the send off for Captain America which might have even just been as emotional. You know, Cap is tasked to go back in time and give the Soul Stones back. Which to be fair in my own I would also love to see that, even in, in an animated form for like the Disney streaming service. Like I'd love to see that little mini series. But uh so yeah, he's told, yeah, put the time, put the stones back in the original times and then come back. Uh, he puts the stones back, but then he doesn't come back and then you just see by the lake just an old man and it's Cap and he's, he went back to the 40s and lived out a married life with Peggy and it's, oh, it's just a beautiful moment and he gives Falcon the shield, which just felt Despite the fact that in the comics it's Bucky, it's like, he's Sam just, it was a beautiful moment that it was Sam and not Bucky because it just felt right for Sam to have it because Bucky had just
discuss.